Welcome to part five of this series of presentations that describe the mammalian stress mechanism postulated by Hans Selye. This slideshow will discuss the tissue repair component of Selye's mechanism. Selye's stress mechanism is a single cohesive mechanism, but it is easier to comprehend in terms of two semi-independent subcomponents called the capillary gate component and the tissue repair component. The tissue repair component, which is illustrated in blue in this simplified diagram, regulates factor 7 activity to govern the location, degree, and duration of thrombin generation in extravascular tissues in accord with the degree, duration, and location of stressful tissue disruption to enable tissue repair. This sounds simple, but the devil is in the details. The previous slideshow explained how the vascular endothelium alters the interaction of blood enzymes with tissue factor in accord with different types of stress. This presentation will add more details that explain the nature of tissue repair. This will be followed by slideshows that explain the capillary gate mechanism. Thrombin energizes all the cell and extracellular enzyme activities involved in tissue repair, including platelet activation, hemostasis, inflammation, chemotaxis, mitosis, metabolism, hypertrophy, angiogenesis, immune activity, and replacement tissue production. The tissue repair component continuously generates small amounts of thrombin in all tissues to energize the slow collagen turnover and cell replacement necessary for tissue maintenance. It generates high levels of thrombin to energize hemostasis in the immediate aftermath of injury. It then maintains moderate thrombin elevations within a narrow range to optimize tissue repair. As tissue repair nears completion, it returns thrombin generation to maintenance levels. Tissue repair proceeds in a predictable sequence of bleeding, hemostasis, inflammation, chemotaxis, cell proliferation, cell differentiation, and remodeling. Each, phase, each of these phases merges smoothly into the next, which implies the presence of a cohesive process controlled by a single mechanism, but no such mechanism has previously been described. The first event in tissue repair is hemostasis that stems blood loss and restores the barrier between flowing blood and extravascular tissues. Coagulation begins with the formation of a white clot consisting of activated platelets. Note the rich layer of tissue factor in the arterial wall outside the basement membrane and beneath the vascular endothelium. Tissue damage immediately exposes this tissue factor to blood enzymes and initiates the generation of thrombin, soluble fibrin, and insoluble fibrin in the damaged tissues. Simultaneously, systolic blood flow dynamics force platelets into the damaged tissues. Thrombin attracts the platelets via chemotaxis and activates them causing them to change shape and release thromboxane that induces vasoconstriction in surrounding venules and arterioles, which reduces blood flow in the injured tissues and facilitates hemostasis. Propagating strands of insoluble fibrin bind the platelets into a white clot that temporarily restores the barrier between flowing blood and extravascular tissues and stems blood loss. Factor VIII plays a key role in hemostasis. It accelerates thrombin generation to produce insoluble fibrin in the immediate vicinity of tissue damage to enable clot formation. The gigantic size of factor VIII prevents it from penetrating the clot of its own making, which explains why coagulation is limited to the immediate vicinity of tissue damage. Rising levels of insoluble fibrin bind red cells into a more permanent red clot that replaces the white clot and substitutes for the damaged vascular endothelium. 
The red clot stems blood loss, but its more important function is to regulate thrombin generation to optimize tissue repair. Like the vascular endothelium, the viscoelastic red clot is selectively permeable. It allows the penetration of factors 7 and 10, which interact with tissue factor in the damaged tissues and generate thrombin that energizes repair cell activity. Rising thrombin levels activate thrombin-activated fibrinolysis inhibitor, or TAFI, which strengthens the clot, reduces its permeability, and decreases thrombin generation. Declining thrombin levels reduce the activity of TAFI, which increases the permeability of the clot and increases thrombin generation. The clot thus regulates thrombin generation in the damaged tissues within a narrow range that optimizes cellular tissue repair activities and prevents excessive thrombin levels that cause malignant repair cell hyperactivity. Inflammation follows coagulation in the tissue repair sequence. Rising thrombin levels in the damaged tissues energize the release of cellular hormones including chemokines, cytokines, caspases, prostaglandins, and bradykinin that dissolve the basement membrane that holds cells in tight formation and loosens cell connections. The rising thrombin levels also activate gap formation in capillary walls that allow soluble fibrin, blood enzymes, and plasma to penetrate into adjacent tissues, causing tissue edema. Soluble fibrin deposits form a matrix or lattice structure in the damaged tissues that facilitates cellular repair activities. The elevated thrombin levels cause increased cellular metabolic activity, which generates heat and elevates tissue temperature, and cell hormones promote perfusion. These activities explain the inflammation syndrome, which the ancient Greeks classically described as a syndrome consisting of tumor, or swelling, rubor, or redness, dolor, or pain, calor, or heat, and functiolasa, or loss of function. These seemingly unrelated manifestations of tissue repair occur in concert due to thrombin elevations. The next event in the tissue repair sequence is chemotaxis. Thrombin-seeking repair cells in undamaged adjacent tissues move between the loosened cells and inflamed tissues to enter damaged tissues where thrombin energizes their repair, repair activities. The next phase of tissue repair is proliferation, where the, the arriving repair cells begin thrombin-energized repair activity. Fibroblasts multiply and generate collagen to produce granulation tissues that fills empty spaces. Immune cells phagocytize debris and bacteria and produce immune proteins to prevent infection. Myoblasts produce muscle and osteoblasts produce bone to replace damaged tissues. Angiogenesis, or capillary formation by endothelial cells, perfuses the proliferating repair tissues. The cells release chemokines, cytokines, caspases, prostaglandins, and other cellular hormones to communicate with one another to coordinate their repair activities. The final phase of tissue repair is remodeling. As the vascular endothelium proliferates and restores the barrier between flowing blood and the damaged tissues, thrombin levels gradually decline. This progressively reduces repair activity until thrombin levels fall below a critical threshold, whereupon the clot disintegrates and disappears, and repair cells begin to undergo apoptosis that shrinks the healing tissues and draws wound edges together to complete the repair process. Thrombin generation returns to maintenance levels, but the remodeling process continues for the remainder of life and the damaged tissues never completely return to normal. The previous slideshow explained how the vascular endothelium governs contact between blood enzymes and tissue factor in accord with the type, location, and duration, and degree of stressful forces. Another variable that affects tissue repair component activity is the concentration of tissue factor. 
Organs that are rich in tissue factor, such as the brain, lung, and placenta, are hypersensitive to systemic thrombin elevations caused by surgery, sepsis, trauma, and other stresses. This explains the nature of ARDS, MOFS, DIC, eclampsia, malignancy, and the surgical stress syndrome. The brain is characterized by the highest metabolic requirements of all tissues. Brain tissue is accordingly endowed with astrocytes that produce TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, that disintegrates insoluble fibrin to protect perfusion. As a result, brain tissue is notoriously vulnerable to hemorrhage. This bleeding tendency is partially offset by high levels of tissue factor but this makes the brain a target organ for stress. Systemic thrombin elevations induced by surgery, sepsis, and trauma activate inflammatory gaps in brain endothelium that undermines the blood-brain barrier and allows soluble fibrin to invade brain tissue and disrupt brain function. This explains why mental dysfunction is a prominent consequence of sepsis, surgery, and trauma. Head trauma releases tissue factor into systemic circulation, causing harmful systemic factor 7 activation that exaggerates morbidity and mortality. The elevated tissue factor level also explains why a brain is, is a target organ for both primary and secondary malignancy. High tissue factor level minimizes bleeding in delicate lung tissue, but it exaggerates the sensitivity of lung tissue to stress. Inhaled particulate antigens, such as pollen, deposit on the inner walls of airways and provoke soluble fibrin production in the form of mucus exudates that reduce the diameter of airway passages and cause asthma. The problem manifests mostly in young children, with small airway passages and is exaggerated during exhalation when airway diameter is further reduced. Bacteria and viruses provoke soluble fibrin production that floods pulmonary alveoli with exudates that disrupt gas exchange, causing pneumonia and influenza. Systemic thrombin elevations due to surgery, trauma, sepsis, blood transfusion, and cardiopulmonary bypass pump exposure cause harmful inflammatory effects in lung tissue that manifests as atelect atelectasis, ARDS or adult respiratory distress syndrome, transfusion related lung injury or TRALI, and systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. All these phenomena have different names because they occur under different circumstances but they are all essentially early manifestations of multi-organ failure syndrome, or MOFS. All these have, um, like the brain, lung tissue exhibits exaggerated vulnerability to both primary and secondary forms of malignancy. Pregnancy is a stressful condition that exaggerates factor VIII activity. The placenta is rich in tissue factor, which offsets bleeding, but exaggerates the risk of malignant mole and choriocarcinoma. As pregnancy progresses, amniotic fluid becomes polluted with meconium that is rich in tissue factor. These stressful factors exaggerate the risk of diabetes, hypertension, and eclampsia, which, which is essentially identical to multi-organ failure syndrome. The direct entry of amniotic fluid into systemic circulation sometimes provokes systemic factor VII activation, which not only causes acute eclampsia, but also consumes fibrinogen and fibronectin, which paralyzes hemostasis and causes disseminated intravascular coagulation. These pathologies cannot be fully appreciated without an understanding of ca the capillary gate component operation, which will be the subject of subsequent slideshows. Malignancy is confusing because it is a systemic disease with local manifestations. It will one day be, be regarded as the opposite of apoptosis. It is caused by chronic environmental stress that induces occult stress mechanism 
hyperactivity that persistently elevates systemic thrombin levels. This increases blood viscosity and coagulability and induces occult systemic inflammatory effects that promote cell proliferation that disrupts adjacent tissues, releases tissue factor, and stimulates nociception that further exaggerates thrombin generation. Such a vicious cycle becomes malignant when it becomes self-sustaining. Cancer cells are essentially identical to normal tissue repair cells engaged in the peak phase of tissue repair, which explains why cancer is often difficult to diagnose. Cancer occurs primarily in organs that are rich in tissue factor, such as brain, lung, and placenta. The systemic thrombin elevation explains why seemingly unrelated types of cancer appear in different locations. Cancer seldom kills by directly invading vital organs or causing lethal hemorrhage. Instead, most victims succumb to the effects of elevated blood viscosity and coagulability, such as infarction, pulmonary embolus, and organ dysfunction. Surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy are misguided and counterproductive treatment strategies because they exaggerate stress mechanism hyperactivity. A better approach would be treatments that inhibit thrombin generation and induce apoptosis. In theory, cancer could be cured safely and comfortably within 24 hours by using such treatments. It is time for another break. The next slideshow will present the shortcomings of conventional hemodynamic physiology as a prelude to introducing the capillary gate component.